The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Mason Stevens Limited, ABN 91141 447 207, AFSL 351 578, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Decision. The opinions expressed within the podcast are solely the individuals and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Mason Stevens. Hello and welcome. My name is Brendan Dade, Senior Financial Advisor at Lorica Partners. Thank you for joining me on this deep dive into all things investment committees. We'll be talking about how to start one, how to make the most of this part of an advice business, and some of the best practices uh, that go into making these work really well. It will be a four-part series where we hear from some of the leading minds about how to make investment committees work. Thanks for joining me. This series is brought to you by Mason Stevens, a specialist wealth platform provider that focuses on managed account solutions. Recognised by Investment Trends in 2023 as the most improved platform and by advisor ratings in 2022 for best advisor support, Mason Stevens offers outsourced CIO services that complement their platform and managed account solutions. Established in 2010, Mason Stevens is led by some of Australia's most experienced finance and investment professionals. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of uh, the Ensemble podcast talking about investment committees. And here with me this morning, we have Alex Hunt, a partner at Moran Partners Financial Planning. Welcome, Alex. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Brendan. Thank you very much for having me on. Looking forward to it. Uh, me too. Me too. Uh, Alex, if you could, uh, could you give us a quick little background on, on yourself and your practice? Yeah, sure. So I guess I've, it seems like it's come up pretty quickly, but it's now about 15 years I've been in financial services. Um, started when I was still at uni. I was, a, I was a late person getting into uni. And and when I first came for the interview here, I borrowed a shirt from my dad and started working one day a week um, while I was still finishing undergrad. And I, yes, yeah, so I guess over the years, you know, I haven't loved it. I've only, it's the only financial services place I've ever worked. Um, so I started here and I haven't left. I've sort of made my way up through the ranks Became an advisor, I think it must have been 2011, something like that, mm-hmm. um, after a couple of years power planning. And yeah, have been here ever since through a few different iterations of the business over the journey. We became self-licensed in 2013 um, when we merged with another practice who was around the corner. Um, mm-hmm. And that was one of the, I think, the, the best moves we ever made. It gave us a, a fair bit more, I guess, autonomy around what we were doing. And actually, from a cost point of view at the time, I think we were more or less saving money compared to how some of the, the the money was going out the door for the licensees at the time. I think since that time, we probably ramped up our spending on other bits and pieces and uh, you know to go along with just the bare bones minimum. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're predominantly a, a practice that's, that's got a retiree client base. Um, that's sort of a legacy of the business being running for probably 25 years as, in total. Um, the older advisor, the, the, my, my, senior, my other partner here in the business now has... Yeah, he's been running for about 25 years. And so there's a lot of clients that have been with him for a very long time and have moved past that sort of transition phase well into the retirement phase. We actually have um, two other or well, three other advisors other than myself. Um, and and we've sort of been gradually shifting younger um, as each advisor comes on. But that's a, that's sort of the natural progression. Um, maybe, so I'd say- Maybe that, reflecting the advisors, is that, uh, uh, is that the case? Are the advisors younger as well? And that's yeah, sort of yeah. Attracting that, a younger client base, yeah. That's right. That's right. I think also, you know- um, Paul Moran, the the other partner in the business, he's kind of getting close to maxed out in terms of clients. Um, been seeing them for a long time. Um, still get a lot of referrals from existing clients, but he's sort of pretty much getting into capacity. So there's more room for 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 the rest of us to take on those clients as well. Um, but yes, as you as you say, you know the rest the, the other advisors are all a little bit younger and therefore tend to attract some of the younger clients. So. Um, we, we do have a bit of a mix. There's a big focus on the retiree clients, which I'll sort of come back to, which feeds into the investment philosophy and, and the investment committee stuff later on. Um, but that's not the only thing we do. We also have some of those sort of, I guess we typically call them accumulators, but you know, those those 35 to 55 year olds in that sort of phase as well. Nice. Oh, excellent. Um, so Alex, tell me about your sort of journey into uh, investment committees. So this is 
uh, a podcast focusing on uh, the whole topic of how to put together and how to run uh, investment committees. We're, on, we're at episode two. Most of our listeners, we imagine, are um, either firms who have maybe started down this path or thinking about going down this path and trying to get a bit more color around uh, how to how to make this work really well in their business. Um, could, could you maybe take me to the start of where the investment committee journey began for you guys? Perhaps it was, I don't know, was it when you when you started and merged with that self-licensed firm? How, how did this all come about for you? Yeah, sure. So it, it's a, an interesting way we got to the investment committee. And actually, it all starts with really the investment philosophy. And I'm sure you've probably covered that. I know that's been covered really well inside the Ensemble platform, and I think you contributed to one of the articles, the the white paper around building an investment philosophy. Um, and so, uh, coming back to practically how that worked for us is we were looking at some research out of the US um, around managing downside equity risk in portfolios. Given that we had quite a large retiree client base, managing downside risk was as a priority, along with you know maximizing return. But for a lot of retirees, a lot of those clients that had been through the the I guess the, what we call the GFC, but the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, um, when traditional portfolio wisdom said, you know, just sit and hold and don't do anything, don't make any rash decisions. And then uh, a lot of people tended to capitulate towards that, um, was it March 2008? Uh, and, and so we, we had a look at this and we were the same and all of our clients that held firm have recovered and did quite well. And anyone that sold out was, you know, kicking themselves for a while. But we were looking at the research around managing that equity downside risk so that we could actually have something up our sleeve to be able to behaviorally reassure clients that we were taking some action, even if it wasn't necessarily to sell everything and go to cash. Yeah. Right? And so behaviorally, they really liked this idea that there was a mechanism that would help at least reduce the the impact of these sorts of market shifts. So we were looking at dynamic asset allocation and, and actually the paper we were looking at did say sell all of your equity allocation and go to cash or and go in and out based on um, some triggers. We adapted that and looked at a dynamic asset allocation strategy where we would adjust the equity allocation in a couple of different tranches. So when we hit one one technical trigger, we would move some of the equity allocation. We either go we either go in or out. Um, and we also had some other rules in there that if we saw a 50% gain in equities in one year, we'd then take the conservative approach to take some profits. That, that was sort of starting to build some rules around that, that how we manage that portfolio. So right. that's what I mean when I talk about investment philosophy. We started to build this dynamic asset allocation investment philosophy um, overlaid with a bit of a, a bias towards income. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to run that dynamic asset allocation in the practice with ROAs was an absolute nightmare. I bet, yeah. You, you know, um, we I don't know how many clients we had, but it, you know, it was probably a couple of hundred across the practice that we were trying to implement this for. And so we had, operationally, we had to make a decision that we would put aside a day a day at the end of the month, um, or we, we'd review the decision, um, the, the triggers at a particular day in the month. Um, then we'd have to write the ROAs. Then we'd have you know wait for them to come back, and then actually action them on an individual account basis. Back this is back in. 2013, 2014. So yeah, right. okay. a lot of the model portfolio to functionality wasn't around back then. So this led us to look at what are the solutions we can look at here. And so managed discretionary account solution was the was the one that made the most sense. We could do all the trades in one go. We didn't need to write ROAs. It solved a lot of our problems. Now, when we went down the path of looking at how we were going to implement this, we didn't have a managed discretionary account license um, as part of our license. So we partnered with someone else who did. And they basically appointed us as the investment manager. But part of the requirements to be the investment manager on the MDA was to have an investment committee that met at least quarterly with an independent chair um, to review and 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 make sure that we were running these in accordance with the, the charter that we also created as part of that process. Right. So that that's really where it started. That's how we got to the investment committee being implemented. Um, and it was really in, in partnership. It was really because we wanted to run this these MDA portfolios, which has been a massive um, productivity improvement from a practice point of view. Yeah, right. Okay, so this is sort of a, a it kind of came out organically for you, for you guys. You, you had an investment idea that sort of come came to the forefront. Um, you wanted to make sure it was implemented as as best as possible, and an investment committee was kind of a necessary structure or a necessary overlay um, to to make that idea work for 
for your advisors and, and for your clients ultimately as well. Yeah, so I think we 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 sort of didn't have the investment philosophy formalized. Um and not, not formalized, but we hadn't we we'd spoken about it a lot. Um we'd we'd tested it, we'd got spreadsheets of back testing, you know. So we had the ideas really in our head, but we didn't have it ha- really written down or formalized anywhere. And so one of the great things about the about that that start in the investor committee was it forced us to formalize it a little bit more and actually adhere and actually have a, have a bit more intentionality about creating it and then managing the portfolios rather than the oh I reckon we should do this this month. Not that there was that, but you know we we were trying to make a rules based approach, um, but also that aligned with our kind of portfolio objectives and and the values on there. Yeah, and, and I imagine, um, without putting words in your mouth, that uh, you know not everybody agrees with this from time to time. They might have a different perspective, and you need a way of coming to a decision, perhaps. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, in, that's part of the reason we have an independent chair, and we like to have an odd number of members, is so that somebody has the tie-breaking <laughs> vote. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to have to come with a decision somewhere, and... Uh... Yeah, hopefully that person doesn't feel like they're to blame if it doesn't go right. <laughs> that, that's right. But I think also, you know, um, when you're thinking about putting together an, an investment committee and thinking about who might be on there, um, you've got to be a little bit careful about egos um, and whether or not people's egos are going to get bruised if they're outvoted. Um, we haven't really had that too often, but, you know, there's been times when there's been, uh, when when that, that, that not everyone's uh, views have aligned perfectly, let's say. <laughs> sure. Well, look, let's let, let's go there because I'd be keen to sort of hear a little bit more about how that worked for for you guys. Because I mean, ultimately, who sits on this committee is a really fundamental part of its success, right? Um, and there's a range of different perspectives. It would seem about who should be on, um, whether you should have independent people, whether you should have um, you know fund managers, um, you know paid consultants, or whether you keep it all internal. You know, there, there seems to be a range of views about how this can be put together. So just sort of keeping things in order, you know, you've gone and explored getting the MDA license or acquiring from the investment committee. So you're now getting set up and selecting who's on there. To maybe tell me a little bit more about the thought process that went into who should be on the committee and what sort of skills, attributes you're looking for. Yeah, so for us, it was a little bit, a little bit different, I think. Back in 2014, there wasn't... Um, as much pressure on us to have an external asset manager or asset consultant. We had our rules-based approach in the portfolio construction, which we'd sort of laid out as part of our application for the to run the MDA portfolios. Um, we also did re- rely on a couple of tools, um, some inputs, so things like the Farrelly's Asset Allocation Guide, if it's yep. worth having a look at for anybody who, who's looking for some sort of input that might not necessarily be a full-time asset or an asset consultant. Um, so you, at least something that that gave us a guide to or a reference point that we could then as a committee make have a discussion about and making des- decisions about. Um, but in terms of who should be on it, for our, from our point of view, given that we already ran the portfolios this way, just in a very cumbersome manner, um, it was really just the, all the advisors in the practice plus an external, an, an independent chair who was outside of the practice. Right, so that was so that was all we started with, um, and that's actually really how it, exactly how it runs today. We've gone down the path of looking at um, asset, speaking to asset consultants, speaking to them around whether they actually come in and run the portfolios full time for us as well, um, and and do the implementation side. Um, to uh, now, we actually get some input, but they don't sit on the committee from from um, the beta shares guys, from the economists, and a couple of their economists. They they dial into our investment committee and give us their views, but they don't sit there and have a vote on how we implement portfolios, either on the asset allocation or or the investment selection side. So it's really just a guidance part from their point of view. Right. And that's presumably a service that they offer as um, part of of their offering broadly. Is that right? Yeah. That's something that I think you'd have to speak to your BDM about if over at BetaShares about how you would engage them in that capacity. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So you've so you've kicked off with with an independent chair and the advisors. How did you go around setting up the processes of of what the investment committee is going to look at? And you mentioned a charter before. Um, how how did all this originate? Um, so when we started, it was with managedaccounts.com.au, which became Explore Wealth, which is now part of Hub. They gave us a lot of that framework to begin with to sort of go through that process. 
So we looked at, you know, we adapted it for our own, to, to, to mesh our own um, style, but but we created the charter and we also started with a, a an agenda that they got, an agenda for each meeting that they gave us, which we've sort of really changed up along the way, but it's not nothing too um, fancy. It's really just making sure that we're covering off on issues that are open in the, that are still open from previous meetings, um, reviewing the minutes from the last meeting, um, portfolio performance against benchmarks and, and, you know, buys and sells, any changes in the portfolio. So we're reviewing all the decisions that have been made. Usually it's kind of looking back, but we also then have a, have a section on, you know, thematic tilts, given that, that we run dynamic asset allocation portfolios as well and corporate actions and, and sort of all those sorts of things. So corporate actions, cause we're dealing with it at an MDA level, we're, we're looking at, are we, what are we doing on each of these particular corporate actions across the whole portfolio? We don't really individualize in that sense um, for clients at, in that service unless they have a specific request to. Um, but so that it, the process really started from having a, a template of an agenda and I'm happy to share that our one with anyone if they would like to have a quick look at and see what it looks like. It is a bit more focused on that MDA side, but it certainly has the um, the, the bones of a of an investment committee agenda that you can work with and, and tailor to your own needs. Yeah, excellent. Excellent. Um, you mentioned before about the uh, investment philosophy and how that sort of tied in with the committee. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, since you set up, this was quite a while ago, um, have you, as a committee, uh, made any sort of updates or what's the interaction between the sort of stated philosophy of the firm and, and the investment committee? Is that something that um, has evolved over time or is it something that sort of stayed, you know, reasonably foundational? How, how has that looked? Yeah, it's it's actually probably stayed reasonably foundational. There's been updates, but nothing dramatic. There's been no dramatic shifts. It's sort of, we started with the the portfolio objective in mind. Um, as I said, we've got, given that we've got quite a large retiree base as a practice, we, we have two styles of portfolios. We have pension portfolios where we're biasing towards income to pay, you know, creating cash flow to pay pensions typically. Yep. And um, then we have your more typical accumulation style growth portfolios. We only got five. We got three income, two accumulation. That's enough. It covers pretty much all of the bases that we need for those model portfolio styles. There's always things that come up that that it sit a little bit differently from you know um, people need individual or tailoring, but that's they're they're kind of our building blocks. And and so we haven't really had and the the objective certainly hasn't changed. It's more just around okay, maybe some of the portfolio construction rules have changed slightly with the times. Um, right. It's always had a dynamic asset allocation, which we adjust over time, but we, you know, as, as opportunities arise, but we actually haven't really, we've done one strategic asset allocation update in that sort of what are we, eight, nine year period. Yeah, right. Um, and even then it was only relatively minor. It was just, a, you know, again, if, given that we've got an income focus in some of those portfolios, we buy us a little bit heavier to Australian shares where we get a bit more of dividend income and franking credits. Um, but so, but for the most part, it actually hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, we, we did do a lot of direct equities early on. Uh, we do a lot less of them now. Just time and expertise is not really where, it's not really where we want to spend our time in that research and picking. But so we've got some other tools that we use to either help pick them or we've bundled them up in sort of smart beta strategies. Right. Right. Gotcha. So you're just going for those or more broadly targeting those factors in in the market that's easier and um, maybe more straightforward way to get exposure to. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I'm curious uh, to talk a little bit more about the um, the, the members of the committee and, yeah. how, and how the members sort of in, interact with each other. Um, <laughs> you sort of said before about you got to watch people's egos and uh, advisors uh, often tend to have them to, to some degree. But at the same time, you know, you obviously don't want this to be something that everybody, you know, just agrees with and it becomes a, a rubber stamp or a ticker box exercise. Can you talk to me a little bit more about how that balance has worked for you? And I don't know, what's what's hard about that? What's what, What's easy about getting that? Um, mix right uh, within the committee itself. Yeah, good question. So we we typically just have all the advisors sit on the committee because they're we're a small firm. They're part of the firm, and they they more or less have clients invested in the way that we run the models. 
Um, so it's not really, so from a selection point of view, you, you get in by default by being part of the practice. Yeah. Um, but a couple of us do like playing devil's advocate, um, which, you know, that, and we sort of figure that that's what the investment committee is for because, uh, you know, my, my, the other partner in the business, Paul Moran's done a doctorate in behavioral finance. Um, and so, yes, we, we're, we're kind of aware of biases and so I, you know, often question, are we, is there too much confirmation bias if we all agree? So if we all agree, then everyone sort of looks at each other and says, hold on a minute, let's just say, what if we're wrong? Um, you know, we think, we think we're right, but we might not be. Um, so you, you're right. You don't want just a series of head nodding. Yep. Everyone agrees. It's all, yep. We must be right. Yep. This is all good. What you want is a bit of debate, even if you end up agreeing it, and even if your starting point's an agreement, but we always like to tease out some of the, the issues or, or challenges that we see in any of the changes we're making or potential changes we're not making. So I think that's always a bit of fun and you need, that's where you actually, you need to have a little bit of ego because you, you, you want to actually have that argument. You want to have, you want people to share their views, um, but you also have to be able to accept, uh, you have to be able to accept the decision of the committee if you're not on the right side of it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, can you give me an example, you know, is, is there anything contentious that sort of comes to mind where, I don't know, is it usually around, is it usually around that asset allocation piece? Is it about, you know, sort of econ, you know, economic logic about what might be happening in markets? Where, where does this sort of practically, um, rear its head? I think it is generally in, in times of, um, market stress. So let, look, you know, let's look at March 2020, the COVID, uh, spiral downwards. Um, you know, one of our core book, core priorities in the portfolio is capital protection. So we probably went a little bit more defensive than we typically would just on how bad the news was. Um, and there was there was not necessarily agreement in the investment committee about that move on some of the portfolios. That was really on the income portfolios. It was to be, uh, you know, in that in that lead up that February March, we became we went we we went defensive more defensive than we probably and certainly what we did on the accumulation portfolios. All right. And yes, there was an there was a disagreement there. In the end, the committee decided that, but and again, based on the feedback from clients from back in the GFC, that they would rather us do something than nothing. And so we made it. We we did sell out of some equities at, at exactly the wrong time. Um, <laughs> in that in that time. Now, again, talking to clients after that, they were perfectly happy with the decision. We got no blowback on that. Um, right. But it's a point where the committee had a, did not necessarily a, agree exactly on the right way to go. But in the end, you know, we we didn't lose any clients out of that. Yeah, the reasons were were sort of explained, and the communication went out. And yeah, I guess if, if people are happy with why you're making that decision, it goes a long way to helping stay on the course, right? Yeah, well, I think you know we uh, yeah exactly right. Fear fear is a powerful motivator, um, and people were happy to hear from us and are happy to hear that some action was being taken, right? Yeah. Um, even if the committee didn't, as I said, didn't necessarily completely agree on it. Another one has actually just been on um, investment selection side, whether we've gone too overweight in some particular asset classes or not enough. Um, that happens from time to time, but it's generally, you know, we're talking about shifting a percent, a couple of percent here or there. It's not, you know, it's certainly not a material disagreement or um, generally we're, we're we're able to pretty well align. But one thing, you know, just I want to bring up is uh, a few years ago, we when we brought some new people into the investment committee, when we had some um, change in the advisors in the practice, uh, is that we sort of challenged them that every meeting to come with an idea, right? Okay. So, uh, because I think it, what we didn't want was not necessarily passengers, but we, you know, there are some strong personalities on the committee. And as I said, Paul and I like to play devil's advocate and argue with each other if even if we actually agree. Um, and so sometimes we can dominate a little bit and so rather than everyone just saying, yeah, yeah, you guys are right um, or wrong or whatever, whichever way we land, it, what we wanted was everyone to come with their own idea around whether or not there should be any action in the portfolio or where they see an opportunity or where, they've, where they're worried about a risk so that we actually have at least input from everyone. And they, but also it means that they feel a lot more involved, a part, big, bigger part of the decision-making process rather than just passive, not passive, it hasn't all the right word, but um, r rather than just having to go with whatever we decide. Sure. Okay. That, yeah, that sounds, that, that sounds really good. I guess that you can't uh, just sort of coast along too much if you're uh, going to be put on the spot about something. 
Yeah, but also I think you need to develop the expertise um, and it's a way for those people that are, were newer to the investment committee to be able to um, gain the experience but also have have some impact on the decision making. I, I, I don't know about you, Brennan, but I always feel like um, you never really quite, until you've got skin in the game, until you, you're the one that's made the call, you don't quite feel the consequences um, and it's, it's a theoretical, yeah, I should have done that or would have done that, but it's yeah. a different story when when you're the one bearing the consequences in a way. Yeah, it's one thing to be in the crowd and you know watching watching the game on the on the pitch, but as soon as you step out there yourself, it, it takes a different dynamic. Absolutely. And how do you? So what what's worked well for you as far as that upskilling process, right? Because as you know, as far as being on an investment committee, there's really no finish line as as far as expertise. Um, you know, markets change all the time and. Um, there's always plenty to learn. Um, have, have there been any? Have there any been been any sources of education that you've utilised, or other people on your committee have utilised that you that you really liked, that you thought worked really well, or um, you know, tell me how that looks for you guys. Yeah, sure. So I think there's a few there's a few things we read, we all read, um, which we all kind of like. So there's there's um, some commentary from people like Christopher Joy, which is always entertaining. Uh, David Bassanese. So there, there's a few people. So we we don't tend to read everything. We find there's a few things that we, a few people we think are on the money or have some analytical view that that is goes a little bit deeper than others um, that we can sort of that resonates maybe a little bit more with us. So that, that's the first thing, and they're the kind of weekly things that you might skim. Um, so find, I'd say, find the things that resonate with you around how the world looks and how to help shape your view of, of the world in, in markets and economics terms. Um, but then also, um, I really enjoy, I, what, you know, I love the investment side of things. That's kind of the fun part of this job for me. I mean, uh, you know, the, the client facing stuff, don't get me wrong, that's the really rewarding part. But, you know, the, the other fun part is to learn about investment markets, investment performance, portfolio construction. So I, I usually attend, um, a few of the portfolio construction forum events each year, and I find those really valuable in um, exposing me to a lot of dif- different people's analysis and forecasts um, and reads on what's happening, as well as other particular, you know, other potential strategies that might feed into how we run the portfolio, or how to make it a little bit better. Um, yeah. So I think that's one of the more valuable ones. But yeah, I think there's a lot of I, I, they're the ones that I pick partly because of time as well. You know, the portfolio construction, I'm happy to put aside a day or two, um, but it's certainly not, you know, it's hard to get away at for lots of little chunks of time sometimes as well. Um, and also I think, you know, you can be a bit more present and, and, and try and soak in as much as you can in those days when you're not thinking, not trying to jump between tasks and, and other sort of meetings. Um, yeah. But you, no, you're right. Right. Graham Rich and the, uh, and the team do an excellent job over there for sure. They do a fantastic job. I mean, I still, I would love to do the CFA. That's probably, it's on my list of things that I'd love to do. That was probably the plan until I, until um, FASIA came out and sort of had to, I, I was okay. I've still got to, still had to do one unit. And, um, but sort of there was a little bit of a hold on that for a while, waiting to see what, what I was actually going to have to then go and complete. Uh, and then having children also got in the way of the study time because the free time has well and truly disappeared. Um, but I'm hoping I get a little bit more of it back to to sort of undertake some of that in the near future. But that's probably where I'd go next. Um, but you're right; I don't think it ever ends. Um, it's you know, it's a labour of love for me. Yeah, sure. sure. And um, it, tell me a little bit more about how the that time commitment has has looked for for you and your practice because. Yeah, advisors world is always uh, pulled in in a bunch of different directions. Um, so when sort of zooming back to when you started the committee, and uh, maybe reflecting on where you're at now, how has that time commitment evolved? And and maybe paint me a picture of what it might look like uh, on an annual cycle today. Right. So uh, I you know I talked a bit about what it looked like operationally at the start to implement changes. Um, now we can really implement a portfolio change across the whole practice in a matter of minutes. Um, we tend to take a little bit longer just to double check that um, uh, you know we're not putting anyone into negative cash. Um, well, we can do that, but you know just to make sure that all we're not we're not leaving them too too thin. So really, a couple of minutes from a portfolio action, um, 
and and certainly for a rebalance as well to create the orders and then and, and then execute them. So we don't typically make huge changes throughout the year. They tend to be fairly small with a with probably an annual rebalance. Um, we looked at doing it in a more frequent manner, but part of the reason we've gone for annual is to is to try and let your winners run a little bit. Hope you know we we like to think that we can we you know our, our thesis is often take a little bit of time to play out. Um, mm-hmm. and we often think we're right well before the market does, um, if, if, if we are. Um, so we don't rebalance a whole lot. So there's not a huge time commitment in terms of actually implementing the, the, the changes operationally. The investment committee meets four times a year. We're probably an hour and a half meeting most of the time, um, that, and that's quarterly. We produce a, a performance update as well as commentary on that as part of those quarterly report pack that gets reviewed at the investment committee. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that takes a little bit of time, but it's not too much. And then I guess all there's all there's the informal subcommittee meetings, which is really just us. It's an informal version of the investment committee where we often make a lot of decisions um, in you know as we're going, rather than having to wait for the next quarter. We don't make big decisions intra quarter. It's more around a couple of switches, or for example, waiting on the next rate rise, or um, you know, currency might. You know, would, one of the last ones we did was when the, the the Aussie dollar hit 62 US cents and we switched into the hedge version of a international right. fund. You know, so that's sort of stuff that we don't wait for the committee to make that change because we sort of already talked about it at the last committee meeting. But we also do that inside of a Microsoft Teams channel, um, mm-hmm. which is a good way for everyone to first of all see to chat about it, um, see it, record it, and. Um, have that sort of order trail in there for the that we can go back and look at in the committee as well. Right. Okay, cool. And is that is that sort of broken down as part of your charter then? Perhaps that you, your head IC meeting is reviewing minor intra quarter changes. Have you got perhaps you got some thresholds around what sort of decisions can be made at that level versus needs to sort of go up to the full IC and, and all that sort of thing. It's probably not a bad thing to have, but we don't have that in the charter. The ch- you know, given we did this in 2014, we we didn't have the tech tools that we have now, um, and and we were all in the office full time, five days a week, and would have um, sort of you know still informal subcommittee meetings. And and ba- back then we used to sit the uh, the phone and the audio recorder on the on there, and I don't think anyone's ever listened to them again. But right, so that's where something like the Microsoft Teams channel or Slack or whatever you want to use it works really well. But it, yeah, we haven't updated the charter to, to sort of reflect that. There isn't really a sort of a, a limit to what the subcommittee can do, a formal limit to what the subcommittee do. But given that we're all, um, other, than, other than the independent chair, we're all on the committee anyway, it hasn't really been an, a factor. Alex, I'm, I'm curious to know a little bit more about how this has looked for you uh, when engaging with uh, new uh, fund managers or, or investment partners. Um, I think what appeals to uh, a lot of advisors about having an IC is perhaps the structure that comes around uh, making assessments uh, for for who might be included in the portfolio. I guess it also um, prevents your diary from being um, filled up with uh, with with BDM meetings uh, <laughs> all, all day every day. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how that? looked for, for you guys in engaging with those new investment partners and, and how that looks? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we we try and catch up with all of the investment managers in the portfolios at least once a year. Um, we try and schedule those very close to the quarterly investment committee meetings. And at times in the past, we've sort of said, instead of the whole hour, you've got 15, 20 minutes <laughs> to, you know, because we... we just a bit short on time, but you're right. So uh, the other side of it is having everyone, having all the four advisors here on the investment committee is we want them all to be in the meeting so that we're all hearing the same thing um, r- rather than sort of just meeting with one or two. Um, in terms of how we assess them, we don't have exactly a, a, a formal framework. However, it really comes back to the investment philosophy. And for things like, um, you know, cost, um asset allocation, uh, you know, active versus passive, you know, what, what are those things that, that you prioritize, that we, pro- that we prioritize um, in terms of the portfolio construction and the investment philosophy and how does the investment manager fit in with those, as well as looking at um, where do they serve a purpose in terms of creating the portfolio outcome that we're looking for. So is it, 
diversification where we can sort of lower the volatility of the portfolio, where we still get a, um, where it doesn't compromise the return. You know, those sorts of things where we might look at an alternative manager or are we looking at an Aussie equity manager that that is look at harvesting franken credits f- versus just an index fund, for example. Um, so we're really, it's really aligned, trying to align which investment managers are going to contribute to the portfolio outcome we're looking for. Um, but you, but we don't have a formal uh, a formal process that we go through. Um, part of it gets sucked into our analysis as to then what does the total cost of the portfolio look look like? Because we're not we're not active or passive. We sort of sit in more of a core satellite with a smart beta kind of um, core, smart beta passive core, and then the the active sort of satellite approach. So th- mm-hmm. there's not. So it's really around where are they going to fit um, in the portfolio. And do, are they better than the um, incumbents? Not better, but are they going to be do a better job of meeting the portfolio objectives than the incumbents or not? Sure, sure. Um, I, I'm curious to know, uh, having you know run this for you know the better part of a decade now, do you sort of look back on this part of your practice and and think, man, I really wish I did that differently? <laughs> or was there? Can you point to any? any decisions which you really would have changed at the time. And I don't really mean at a portfolio level because, you know, we, we can all go back and find the low points and find the high points and, you know, pretend that we should have known what was going to happen next. But I, I just mean more in how you've made this sort of function of your business serve your advisors and, and help them serve their clients. You know, has there been any sort of mistakes where you go, oh, look, at you know, we really should have just we should have actually had more independent people earlier or we should have had input from these other economists because that's been really helpful and, you know, we didn't get around to do that. Or we hired a very expensive uh, um, asset consultant we didn't really feel they added a whole lot of value. I, I don't know, like whatever it yeah. is. is. Is there anything that comes to mind when you when you sort of reflect back over your time? Actually, no. I think, um, opera, you know, with the, the efficiency pickup has, be, has outweighed, has been brilliant and we've actually haven't really put too many there hasn't been really many decisions that we've made that haven't worked out well for us you know we we did as i said we looked at asset consultants and even back then you know, someone was going to i think get a charge was 0.66 um of on, on the fund that they were managing under that low model portfolio and we you know we made the decision that that was way too much um i think that these days it's probably more like 0.1 is what you typically find in that sort of space so that that was a while ago but um, so, I, you know, I think that's one of the ones where I think we got it right, where we thought, you know, as as appealing as their offer was outside of the cost, the cost, the cost outweighed the benefit. And and in terms of other external parties, look, I guess maybe we probably, if we had have been able to engage them a little bit earlier, that might have led to some better decision making um, in the early days, uh, rather than relying more on the newsletter style things. But being able to um, discuss and and really get some insight from really very very smart and talented people um, would is would have been beneficial. And I think, but the, the ability to ask questions um, and really dive into it is um, is really valuable. So having someone you can bounce ideas off and say, "Hey, but what about this?" What if, and you know, a classic example is the last investment committee we were talking about. Um, you know, talking about fixed income, and I had a question about something or other that 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 had come up reading someone reading something, and that you know the consultant said, "Yeah, but it's the valuation is wrong." Um, you know, the idea is right, but the valuation is wrong. And so, having being able to have um, someone's expertise to to sort of help uh, direct and shape you know your views, as well as uh, you know someone who lives and breathes it every day, um, is is quite valuable. So, that, I think that's probably the one I'd I'd say. Is engaging people that you think have a great handle on things um, and 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 somewhat align with your views on how portfolios should be managed. Yeah, and and I guess someone that you can trust their input around you know whatever challenge or shortcoming you might have internally, right? You know, no no business can know it all in house. Um, you you got to be able to get some of that elsewhere. I think that's a great point because you know, as I said, but we, sometimes we think we're right, but um, we might not be. And having someone to, to challenge your view or, or someone who um, can give a different contrasting point of view is really valuable, even if you don't necessarily change your decision, but at least you're, you might be made aware of 
the opposite side to that or the risk that you're missing. Yeah, sure. And uh, and one thing on that, um, because I understand it's quite common for um, for different fund managers to lend their expertise, and that can be great input into into committees to sort of round out um, round out the expertise within the group. Um, from a from a conflicts position, you know, how do you where do you draw the lines around sort of managing that for for the committee because it gets a yeah you know, potentially sticky, right? Yeah. yeah. So we we don't disclose to the guys at Beta Shares what's in the portfolio, and they don't have any input on the investment selection. So there's 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 no direct conflict in that sense where they're saying you should be in in this, and it's really more at an asset allocation level. And even I suppose on the fixed income side, it goes a little bit into the sub asset classes around how we manage that. But it, yeah, you raise a good point, especially when you've got someone with a barrow to push. Um, who who's providing some advice. Um, and I think we've tried to manage that the best we can by sort of at least having that little bit of separation and not having any, not not giving them a seat at the table, right? Yeah. To, to be able to either select investments or vote on how on the outcomes. It's really just a matter of providing an update and guidance. Um, but yeah, it, it, in that instance um, where you have a fund manager in there, that, that's where you've got to be a little bit careful, I suppose, but I think there are a few there are, you know there are a few asset consultants that are removed from the fund management process that are able to at least give you a balanced view. Yeah, I think that's a spectrum, right? And and everyone's got to figure out how to manage that themselves. And yeah, for you guys to take take away the voting power and um, you know maybe remove them from the specifics about manager selection and that. that but uh, for you guys. It, look, there you're right. There may be a conflict, but you know what? Sometimes that conflict might be in sort of name only you might still be getting a fantastic outcome for both your clients um, and your business and by partnering with a fund manager and okay sure maybe there's a conflict that you might you you were required to use one or multiple of their products but i don't necessarily think that that will always result make a terrible result for the clients Mm. um so there's certainly still some benefit there and i think as long as you're upfront about that Mm. And say, yeah, we've partnered with this manager or this asset, you know, this this asset manager, or, um, to provide this sort of a service, which we wouldn't be able to provide otherwise, or we would have to provide at a much greater cost. Mm. Mm. Um, so it, it, yeah, I think it, as long as you're aware of it and you can rationalise it, um, and I think it's, I don't think it's always a terrible thing. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, I, I'm curious to know. As well, um, Alex, as we sort of draw to a close, um, is there any advice that you'd give to your 2013 uh, self? <laughs> uh, firstly, and and say, you know, what, is there anything that you should you should think about ahead of sort of going down this path? Um, which I know we've sort of already covered, uh, but uh, and also secondly to that, what advice would you give someone who's sort of starting? starting the journey or, or maybe or might be on the fence about whether or not this is something they want to do uh, at all? Ooh, good question. Um, I think, what advice would I give myself nearly 10 years ago? Um, lean on someone for a really good agenda for the investment committee meeting if you're looking to start that up um, because you want to make sure that you're covering off all the bases. Um, find some good asset consultants or or some sort of input that you like and trust um, or have faith in. Um, and if you can find the people at a reasonable cost, get them involved. Uh, find someone who doesn't always agree with you and you can have that open discussion without having hurt feelings. Um, and really, really bed down your investment philosophy. I, I don't think I can stress that enough that that Everything that you do at the committee level really comes back to what are you trying to achieve, and and the investment philosophy is a way that you can refer back to, and everyone can can really have a say in, or or at least uh, understand the decision we're making relate back to to this sort of. I would say formalize it in a document, and there's a few tools around that are really useful in in actually helping you articulate um, that sort of thing. So they'd be my top tips if you're thinking about doing it. Um, I think you've got to ask, why are you doing it? Are you, you know, for us, it was all about the efficiency piece. And so if you're not going to run model portfolios, but you just want to have a consistent view across the practice around how portfolios 
should look, um, which I think has probably been done at licensee level, you know, in the past where licensees sort of mandated this is what this is our our you know our risk profile and strategic asset allocation. Yeah. Um, you know, but I think if you want to have a bit more control and actually impart a bit more of your own investment knowledge or expertise or input, then this is a way to keep it a bit more consistent across advisors in the practice. And yeah, I think uh, you can have a bit more faith that that all portfolios will look more or less the same or similar. Um, and especially, you know, at a model portfolio level, it makes it much easier come review time to know what's in someone's portfolio. So, I mean, I think that all relates back to the investment committee part for us. Yeah, right. and like you say, it's the efficiency of getting those best ideas implemented and executed in someone's portfolio um, as quickly yeah. as possible, right? Yeah. One other thing I just sort of mentioned is uh, have a think, have a think about the tools you want to use to actually implement it and run it. Um, so you know, if you're going to run model portfolios, you're going to run these asset allocation uh, models for even if they're not model portfolios, but you you sort of have a view on what a conservative or a moderate portfolio looks like um have some sort of repository or some place where you can stick it and run reports on it and you know there's a few tools that we've used over the years that we've tried things like morningstar direct fe analytics and lonsec irate um and just work out which one is suits you which research house you like because that'll also play a bit of a part in which one you choose but yeah especially when it comes to say producing those reports which are great communication tools with clients we go they go out to clients directly those sorts of things that you know that are a big time saver as well as well as giving you the kind of information that you need to make proper assessments on um, the decisions that you've made at the investment committee level and and what tools work for you now what so we've we've gone through a few of them um but at the moment it's we're using lonsec r8 um, so we 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 track the portfolio performance in there um, as well as so we've got we've you know we've got nearly ten years of history now of portfolio returns and actually we've been able to migrate across different tools with with varying success um, <laughs> as to <laughs> how the data links from one to the other but it's all you know just in terms of when you're looking at the portfolio breakdown and things but um, Alex this is where you should have said to you to your earlier self. Just use this tool. And yeah, but it didn't ex- it, it, <laughs> it didn't exist back then. They have ah, right. so many iterations. Um, yeah, fair enough. And but yeah, if you can find a tool, uh, uh, that's one thing that's been from my end anyway. I've done. I've been the secretary. I'm, I've done every role that we have under in the investment committee and, and done all the back end, uh, all the the back end admin. Um, so having a tool that is easy to use and easy to run reports from that don't take any sort of don't take too much work to customize and make it look like your own um, and are reasonably accurate uh, as well is probably, yeah, you're right. That's probably the one, the other tip I'd have. But yeah, we're using Lonsec I rate at the moment um, and we can get a whole series of different data points and and, and uh, out of that tool, which gives us a bit of a view back on, on what's happened and how the decisions have gone that we've made. I, I loved using both FE Analytics and Morningstar Direct. Some There were some limitations in in those and cost was an issue as well so it's about balancing how that work how that looks we're a relatively small operation to being only four advisors um and you know some of the costs started to blow up a little bit with some of those when you're getting into the nitty-gritty when they're designed really for the big end of town fund managers yeah yeah well alex it's been an absolute pleasure chatting uh thank you so much for for sharing your your wisdom and your experience in in this space Uh, We really appreciate your time. Thanks, Brennan. Really happy to be here.